Well, praise God. You know, I shared with you uh, about what the Lord said to me a couple of months ago. And for those who have not been in church, you know, I hope you'll pick on our theme at the moment. Our theme is about, it's all for His glory. It's all for His glory. And you and I know that uh, nothing happens on this earth for man's glory. Nothing happens even in heaven for any one glory. It all happens because God wants to be glorified. Amen. It is everything, you know, that God intends to do and does. It's all for his glory. I know that men like to slip in and take glory and, you know, say that they did, they, that they did this and they did that. But the fact is, you know, man does nothing. It is all what God does in your life and in my life. So, if it's not for our glory, then why is God doing what he's doing if it's only for his glory? The reason is this, is because, see, God is love. The Bible tells us very clearly that God is love. Amen? Now, even before he created anybody, he was declared to be love. Now, whom did he love? If he's called love, and he is love, whom did he love when none of us were created? And even the universe wasn't even created at, that, at a time. It is that he loved the Father, loved the Son, and the Son loved the Holy Spirit. There was such a loving relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now follow with me. This is very, very, very important for us. Because we think that, you know, because everything that happens on this earth is because God loves us. It's not because God loves us only. I know he loves us. But the fact is that they love each other so much that they wanted to do things to glorify each other. Jesus himself said these words. He said, you know, the Father is here to glorify the, sorry, the Son is here to glorify the Father. And the Father is here to glorify the Son. And the Holy Spirit is here to glorify the Father and the Son and to glorify the Holy Spirit. You know, this is the key and the most important thing that we need to learn today because people have lost the fact that we are here to glorify God. They think that they're here to, you know, do things on their own and, you know, and, you know, lap in the glory, sort of to say. But the Bible is very, very clear that as Christians, we must come to the fact that we are here to glorify God and God is here to glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, that was our theme that we started. So as Christians, you know, I said, well, I said on my first, my first uh, week on sharing of, uh, about it's all for his glory, I said, living in God's love glorifies God. God. Uh, John chapter 5 verse 20 tells us, For the Father dearly loves the Son and shows him everything that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will be filled with wonder. Aren't you not filled with wonder when you say God do some amazing things? You know, I've seen the most amazing things God, that God has done, healing the sick. Seen people, you know, given up to die, get healed. You know, all this, God just glorifies the Father and the Son. And guess what? We wonder at what God does in our lives. Many of you seated here have received many miracles in your lives. You've seen the power of God working in your lives, in your homes, in your places of work, in your businesses perhaps. And you wonder, but this is all for the glory of God. He says, he says oh, that men, sorry, uh, for the Father dearly loves the Son and shows him everything that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will be filled with wonder. And I have this revelation that God the Father is glorified by Jesus and Jesus is glorified. It's a revelation that must come to you and me. You know, the most amazing thing is like, you know, people question about the Trinity. Why does the Bible say that this word Trinity is in the Bible? Uh -huh. You know, because it's not something that the intellectually you can grasp. You can't. It is historical in one sense. And it's also a revelation, you know, in your heart that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is one mean one God, three persons, distinct people, with distinct functions, each of them. See, a revelation is something that God brings into our minds and our hearts where no man can reveal to you, but God has to reveal it into your life and my life. So when we look at the whole line of Scripture, even to understand and realize that, whoa, you know, all this is about their glory, 
might sometimes think, oh, they are very selfish and they are doing things only for themselves. No, it is a revelation that teaches us and tells us who our God really is. It might be, you know, our God is not selfish, he's not, you know. The Lord says he's a jealous God. He doesn't want to share his glory with anybody. And when we come to the knowledge and have the revelation that whatever we do and think and say is for all for his glory, then we realize why we are living on this earth. The second point that I shared with you was living in God's grace glorifies God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 12 tells us, We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. As you know, many people live religiously under the law. The law, the law says God will not give it to you because you don't qualify. In other words, you and I get nothing from God because we live according to the law. But grace says, that grace is a person. The Bible says truth and grace came by Jesus. Grace is a person. So because of Jesus and because of his grace, we can, be, we can receive from God in every way. For what reasons? For God to be glorified. So what is grace? God's unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor upon each and every one of us. That's a whole sermon by itself, which I preached, and also, you know, living God's love also was a whole sermon by itself. I'm just taking, you know, little, little bit pieces from here and there. Then we said living in God's mercy glorifies God. Living in His mercy, which sometimes we don't recognize, living in His mercy also glorifies God. Psalm 136 tells us, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. I believe we are all here today, this morning, is because of the mercy of God. Amen? Because God has shown us mercy, and we are all here for those reasons. God is more inclinable to mercy than with wrath. I think God's mercy is His darling attribute. Because of His mercy, you and I are saved, which He most delights in towards you and me. You know, it was God's mercy that kept Adam and Eve from being wiped off from the face of the earth when they sinned. It was His mercy. You know, being a righteous, perfect, holy God, He could have, you know, just wiped them off when they, when they, when they disobeyed God and committed sin and put the whole human race into this whole, you know, scenario of being sinners ever since we were born. We were conceived in sin because of what Adam and Eve did. You know, He should have wiped them off and recreated and he brought in a new Adam and a new Eve, but he didn't do that because of his mercy. He had mercy upon Adam and Eve. And then, of course, last week or the week before, we shared about living in God's goodness. Living in God's goodness glorifies God. Psalm 107 verse 8 tells us, Oh, that men would praise and confess to the Lord for his goodness and loving kindness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Everything in God is good, though people blame God for all the evil that is taking place in the world. They don't realize that there is a, there is a, a common adversary that we have, the devil, that is bringing all the suffering and all the, all the wars and you know what's happening in Sri Lanka and the Ukraine and Russia and all over the world. We have a devil and you know the most amazing thing is that the devil has been able to keep himself secret that nobody even recognizes that what he's doing and what he's doing in, in, in the world. You know, how many of you would say what's happening there is because of what the evil one is doing? I never heard of people ever saying in the world, church will recognize it. Anybody in the world saying, oh, look at what the devil is up to now. No one says that. Because the fact is, he has, he has disguised himself so well. You know, and as the Bible says, you know, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That recognition, they, they don't even know what's going on in the world. Who is behind all of this? Oh, God is behind all of this. God is not behind any of this stuff. Because there is no evil in God. There is no wickedness in God. He's not punishing people by killing people. And he hasn't got even a working relationship with the devil. As some seem to think that, the God, that God is using the devil, you know, to do his plan and purposes, to kill people. So these are all, you know, fairy tales, like to say, you know. But the fact is that we know we have a common enemy. And whatever God does is good. 
It's good. So, how many of you can confess to the goodness of God? We all can confess to the goodness of God. You know, at one time in the church when somebody says, God is good, what would you return back by saying? All the time. All the time. And when you say all the time, God is good. Has he changed? He has never changed and he can never change because he's so perfect. You know, he's immutable. He can never change. He's every day the same. I don't know about you when you got up this morning, how your mood was. But God, he doesn't have, you know, he doesn't change. He's got no mood swings in his life. He's every day the same. And thank God for that. Imagine if he had a mood swing. Every morning he got up, he looked at you and saw you, or thought you were dentures or something like that. What do you think you would have done? Oh, that guy looks terrible today. You know, oh, I don't want to look at him anymore. He looked the other side. And looks the other side, you know, that person has not been combed perhaps. Oh, no, that's not a good look either. He has not moved in any way, you know, because he has no mood swings. Today I want to share with you about the fifth thing that God told me. And I was lying on that bed and just during the time of January, February. And I was going through a bit of a health issue where I was finding it difficult to breathe and I was, you know, uh, having my, my little heart, you know, I have a heart, don't worry. It was all checked out and it was all good. And, and I was, you know, going through a time and, you know, I, I said to the Lord, Lord, you know, I believe your word. I, I, I have faith to believe for healing. And God has healed me miraculously, instantly, you know, most of the time I have. And, you know, I had a broken neck and he healed me. I had, uh, you know, tonsillitis and he healed me. And a bad back and he healed me. I'm talking about instant miracles that God has done in my life because I exercise faith and I, because I believe the word and God did some amazing miracles. And I have seen God do some amazing miracles in the lives of the people in this congregation. And that is true. But I was on this bed telling God, you know, God, see, I have, I have received my, my faith. And now why are you not answering my prayers? Why are you not hearing me? It was like, you know, my prayers were not going above the ceiling, sort of to say. And the Lord began to talk to me. And he said, I don't do anything for anybody because only of their faith. But whatever I do is because I love them. Because of my grace. And because of my mercy towards them. And because of my goodness. And then he said to me, because I'm faithful to you. You know, the penny dropped from my head, my coconut to my heart. And when it fell, I just thought to myself, you know, all these years and months and, the, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, exercising my faith and thinking I must be rewarded because of my faith. God must do something because I know his word. Because I'm a preacher, because I'm a pastor, he must do it for me. Because, because I know the word of God and, you know, I can hold, hold him ransom to it. But God doesn't work like that. Because if he does work like that, then we get the glory and not him. And he doesn't want you and I to get the glory because he never intended it to be so. We like to lift up men and lift up, you know, people, but God never lifts up anybody at all. He lifts up, you know, he says, all the glory is mine. And he says, do not touch my glory. Then I realized, okay, it's because your love and because of your grace and I just don't, you know, have this stuff. And it is because of your mercy and it's because of your goodness and because of your faithfulness. So let me share this last point with you. Living in God's faithfulness glorifies God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, God is faithful, the Bible says. He's faithful. Haven't you found him faithful? I know some of us at times we doubt his faithfulness. He's reliable. He's trustworthy. And ever true to his promises, he can be depended on. And through him, you were called into fellowship. You were dependable, trustworthy, reliable. You were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. A.W. Tozer writes, all of God's acts are consistent with all of his attributes. Talking about the attribute of his love. Talking about the attribute of his grace and mercy and goodness and his faithfulness. The most amazing thing about God's attribute is that he does not contradict but harmonizes and blends into each other. 
Like I said, the grace and mercy are God's twin attributes. Love and goodness are also twin attributes. Faithfulness is the binding attribute that accomplish them all in your life and my life. You know, it was not, it was, it, if God was not faithful, then all the other attributes of God cannot be relied on. Correct? If God was not faithful, all the other attributes, His holiness, you know, His, His omniscience, His omnipresence, His omnipotence cannot be relied on. So faithfulness means that He can always be dependent on to do what He says He will do. When He says He will do it, and how He says He will do it. Aren't you glad we have a God who is faithful? Think about it. You know, we, we as human beings, we doubt it when things don't work out the way we want things to work out. But the fact is we must resign to the truth of the word of God that tells us that God is faithful. He is faithful. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9 says, Therefore know without any doubt and understand that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God. That's His name, faithful God, who is keeping His covenant and His steadfast loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. That is who our God is known as the faithful God. I would never be able to preach this message this morning if I found out that our God was not faithful. It would be hypocritical for me to stand up here and tell you, you know, if I found out that this God was unfaithful, when I know and experience His faithfulness in my life. Amen? You wouldn't be here today, actually. You wouldn't be here today if God was not faithful to you. Correct? You know, forget all of, our, all of our, you know, shortcomings and all our failings and all that stuff. You know, but you and I know that we will fail. We are not consistent. We, I mean, we, we, we let people down, perhaps. We do all that stuff. But one thing we know, when we come to God, we know that He is faithful. And the Bible says that His faithfulness endures for ever. In every way I found God to be faithful to me. And to others. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 says, If we are faithless, think about it, if we are faithless, he still remains faithful, true to his word and his righteous character, for he cannot, cannot deny himself. Some of we've got to really get this into our spirit. Because it has to deep, it has to filter right down into our spirit. Because we all of us are subject to going through issues and difficulties. And the first thing that the devil will put into our minds, God won't bring you through this. He will let you down. Has, are you so special that he should let you down? No, he wouldn't. See, God's faithfulness is not dependent on our character. He is faithful even if you are not faithful. How do you like that? Even if you are not faithful, and I know we are all not being faithful, not pointy fingers because three fingers point back at me as well. So we are all not faithful. But we know that even though we have been faithless, he has been faithful. That means full of faith. See, we all have products that we can depend on, don't we? Where there is consist consistency of quality and quantity. We love dependable weather like today. We love those who keep their word and we know when it's even difficult. But we know that we all fail. But one thing in God is, He's consistent. He never, never fails. It's not like the Melbourne weather, isn't it? He's consistent. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 23 tells us, They are new every morning. Great and beyond measure is your faithfulness. I don't know when you woke up this morning that you thanked the Lord and declared that He's faithful. Even as I said, the other, we're preaching the other four sections of this message, I said, you know, did you ever get up in the morning and say, Lord, I thank you for your love for me? Who loves you like God loves you? Even your own mother can't love you the way God loves you. He said, even if your mother forgets, that, that mother who forgets, you whom you drank milk from her pap, she says, I won't forget you. That's the, that's the bond of God's love with her, towards us. Bonded in love with Him. And then the grace that He has given us. 
You know, these are so important for us to understand because we go through a world that is so much in turmoil and difficulties and sometimes we don't know where to look for answers and God is saying, hey, come to me, I love you. My grace is always there for you. You know, I've heard many testimonies regarding the faithfulness of God. I just hooked up on Google to find out, you know, some good testimonies about God's faithfulness. Millions. I said, forget it. I don't need to go there because I know the things that God has done in my life and that's good, good enough for me to know that he's faithful. You know, I have many testimonies regarding God's faithfulness. The greatest trial in my life happened to me about 40 years ago when I was robbed of all my savings in a business that went wrong. I guess that was the time the Lord trained me to rely on him and on his faithfulness. It took about six months before God, you know, delivered me and restored me back, working miracles in my life. And I found out within the period of six months how faithful this wonderful God is. During that time, Ingrid and I went through many difficulties financially, but God was faithful. He actually provided miraculously in every situation that we found ourselves in. Even at times when we didn't have money to buy food or put petrol into the, that time we had a motorbike, put petrol into the motorbike. And I'll never forget the miracles that he did. And one I'll never forget, with tears in my eyes, I said to him, Lord, I will never doubt your faithfulness again. Never. And when I look back on all my life, I've seen God come through over and over and over again in a manner that I never expected. But the Lord is always, always faithful. God is faithful to his people throughout history. It's not just for you and me, right through history. He was faithful to Abraham, to the patriarchs. He was faithful to all his prophets. He was faithful to the three Hebrew boys, even though they were put into that fiery furnace. You know, sometimes you would have expected Jesus to come before they were put into the fire. But sometimes God puts you into the fire. Don't you worry. When even if he puts you into the fire, he's still faithful to step into the fire with you. And the best part is this. When you go into the fire, you know, trusting in the Lord's faithfulness, he himself will personally walk into the fire. You remember the story, the three Hebrew boys? The people outside, the Nebuchadnezzar and all of the kings, they all saw the fourth man in the fire, but the three Hebrew boys didn't see the fourth man. But Jesus was in the fire because he said the Son of God was in the fire. Isn't he faithful? We don't want him to send us into the fiery furnace. He wants us to be faithful before, but sometimes he puts us into the fiery furnace. And when he get in there, He's still faithful to bring you out of it. And he brought Meshach, Abednego, I, I, just, I just say it like this, he's shack, my shack and, and my bungalow. He was faithful to Joseph. He was faithful to Daniel in the den of lions. He was faithful to Jonah in the belly of the fish. He was faithful to the Israelites, right? Up to now, the chosen people. And for 40 years in the wilderness, he looked after them. He fed them. He, 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 he rained manna down from heaven. Their clothes grew. Their shoes grew. Can you believe that? For 40 years, he fed them. About 6 million people or so coming across the wilderness. A journey that should have taken them only just 12, 13 days because of their disobedience. Even in their disobedience, he was still faithful to them. He gave them to eat. He gave them water from rocks. This is the God who we serve. This is the God whom we believe. And can we doubt this wonderful, amazing, marvelous, you know, supernatural God who can do it for 40 years faithfully to a group of people that he loved and doesn't he love us? The Bible tells us in, in the book of Numbers that God can never lie. He can never lie. You and I lie. I have lied. Have you lied? Black lies, white lies, blue lies, yellow lies. I mean, all sorts of lies. When it doesn't suit you, it becomes a pink lie as well. No, but the fact is he never lies. Neither, the Bible says, will he change his mind. 
we change the mind all the time. I never forget, you know, I used to make some promises to my kids. And if something went wrong, I said, no, I can't do it. I changed my mind. Oh, see what you did? You changed your mind. God doesn't even do that. He never changes his mind. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, The Lord, for the Lord is good. His mercy and loving kindness are everlasting. His faithfulness to all generations. He is still faithful to all of us, church. Don't ever doubt God's faithfulness in your life. Can I have the next slide up? The other one. See that? Is that a happy bunch of kids? You know why I put the old photographs up? Because every child there has a testimony of God's faithfulness. And uh, healings, provision, university entrance, schooling, song of praise for God's favor, O Lord. You are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise and give thanks to your name for you have done miraculous things. Plans formed long ago, fulfilled with perfect faithfulness. Every one of them there has a testimony. I had a great desire, you know, to have a son. And I thought God had not given me a son. Can you put the next one up? There you see him there. It is, the, it, it is the living who give praise and thanks to you. As I do today, Father, tells his sons about your faithfulness. You know, you think that bringing up the kids and going through issues and difficulties like we all go through, you, 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 you think there is, there is you know, no testimony to the faithfulness of God? You know, stop and think how faithful he's been. I look back now over my whole family. Be married to this wonderful woman for 44 years, and we have six kids. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, our life has been a testimony of the faithfulness of God. Times of real problems and issues, and, you know, times when I thought our marriage is over. At times with the kids, the difficulties with the kids, and, you know, it's, it's, it's never been, been, you know, easy. But what we really saw right through our lives was the faithfulness of God in our lives. To see our marriage through, to see our children through. You know, we went through all and we all have gone through. It's all because of His faithfulness that we have come right. And you know what? Can you put the next slide up? There's my grandchildren there. In all our times of sicknesses and weakness and trials, God has been faithful. If there's one thing that I can testify this morning to you as a church, is that God is faithful. I look at my eight grandchildren there. Aren't they cute? For the Lord is good. His mercy and loving kindness are everlasting. His faithfulness endures to all generations. You know, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, should Jesus tarry, they will all experience the love, the grace, the mercy, the goodness, and the faithfulness of God in their lives. I'm blown away with God's faithfulness. And I thank God that He's a faithful God. And my word to you this morning, as I finish this series on, it is all for His glory. Not for our glory, for His glory. I want you to get hold of this message. When you go through hard times and difficult times, and when you come up against a wall and you say, you don't know what else to do. I've put my faith. I've got people to pray. Like this, we're standing in for, for George. I just say, get back and I say, Lord, I'm just going to trust in your love. I'm just going to trust in your grace, my Lord. I'm just going to trust in your mercy for me and your goodness. I haven't got all the answers, but you have them all. So let it come to me through your faithfulness so that I can be an encouragement to others. The word tells us Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why does he say that? Because he's seen in the lives of people how faithful God has been. Same. Every day the same. 
This is the God that we worship. Not something made out of wood, you know, or some clay. We worship God from our hearts. And he lives inside of us by the power of his Holy Spirit. If you have never accepted Christ into your heart, can I ask you to do that today? And experience this wonderful love and grace and mercy and goodness and faithfulness of God. Don't leave this place the way you came this morning. You don't have to really. Coming to church is not to perform a ritual or a formality or a tradition. Coming to church is to connect with God more intimately and deeply with God. My experiences with God is all, you know, as a result of connecting with Him and Him connecting with me. I want you to connect with God this morning. Can we all stand in close?